Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for leading us in that song. Uh, let me just uh, go ahead and uh, put my suitcase right over here. Okay, yeah, I think this is good. So, hey guys, so I think you guys are probably wondering what it is that Pastor Mike is doing with a suitcase right up on stage. Where, where's he going? What's going on? I mean, does he know about the, the whole pandemic situation going on? Is he planning on going on a trip? Well, no, I'm not actually going on a trip. But today we are talking about going. And uh, I, I really want you to think about this for a moment, right? When was the last time that you saw a person with a suitcase? Maybe, you know, think about this. Maybe when you were at the mall or if you went to a restaurant or if you just on the street, if you saw someone walking with a suitcase like this one and they were just kind of like on a rush, right? Like first thing that comes to mind is, man, that person is going somewhere, right? You think, okay, that, that person is definitely onto something. They're going to a place, they're arriving, or they're going, they're moving. Certainly, you never think of a person that has a suitcase that maybe that person is officially staying put at a place, right? You, you don't usually think that. You think, no, they're, they're going somewhere. In fact, it, it, it can go as far as if you actually were to say the sentence, man, living out of a suitcase, that actually means that a person is just so constantly on the move that they don't even have time to put stuff back in, you know, like in the drawers and stuff. They're just living out of a suitcase because they're constantly going. And um, I know that it may seem a little bizarre talking about this because, I mean, let's face it, you know, like right now we're living in a situation in which we have to stay put. But what if I told you that even in this case, even right now in these circumstances that we're living in, that God is still expecting us to be on the move, that God is still expecting us to go? And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if you thought about that before, but he, I'll, I'll just kind of give you an example, just a bigger, broader example. I'm not sure if you've had the opportunity to go on a mission trip, but I've had the opportunity to go on several. I've, I've actually gone to Cuba. I've gone to El Salvador, I've gone to Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, and just two months ago, just two months ago, I, I had the privilege of going to Haiti. And when I went to Haiti, I went to this little town called Janton, which is just about an hour away from the capital, Port-au-Prince. And what I did there was fascinating. In fact, this was one of, one of the trips that definitely spoke very close to me because this was a trip that I did specifically to help out pastors and community leaders in that little town to basically try to overcome some of the problems that they've had. And so we went in there to literally train them so that they can solve some of their issues on their own. And so it's interesting to me because, you know, every single country that I've been to has been different. It's been unique. But they've all shared this one thing in common. They've all shared some similarities when I've gone to these countries. And I'm not, I'm not saying that they're all the same, but look, <clears throat> Just think about it from this perspective. Like, when I have gotten off the plane, every single time, without a shadow of a doubt, I've always been received with open arms. And people are always yelling, ah, oh, the Americans are here. Oh, you know, the missionaries are here. Yay! And they all get super excited because we've arrived. And so some people that are in these countries... Um, well, when they see Americans flying to their place, they usually think, okay, well, finally, we can ask you for something because we need some help. And so some people will just ask for help. Other people will ask for things. And some people will just be more audacious and actually ask you for money. And look, I don't blame them for asking for those things because, I mean, they live in extreme conditions. But what I've taken into closer consideration is the Christians whenever I go visit these countries as a missionary. Because... I'll actually see what they're expecting from me and from my friends when we go. And one of the things that they'll say is like, man, I'm really excited because now that the missionaries are here, God's word is going to be preached. And now God's word is not only going to be preached, but lives are going to be changed. These missionaries have come and they are going to make disciples. Yes! And so they get super excited. And so what I do with those people that always have the opportunity to be audacious enough to tell me how they're feeling or at least show signs that they're feeling that way, I'll actually stop and I'll tell them right to their face, and this will be my whole plan, that for the entire mission trip, that they get this, that they understand this, that I'm actually not the missionary. And so when I first tell them that, they, they always have looked at me like I'm some crazy, weird guy, like, that mean you're not the missionary. Like, dude, like, you've got the suitcase. Like, hello, like, your, your tag says missionary. Like, what are you talking about? You are the missionary. But I try to help them understand that I'm not really the missionary, that in fact that it's them. Because the reality is, is that I'm only going to be in these countries for about five, 
maybe seven days. And then once my time is up, I'm going to go back on my plane and I'm going to come back home. But they're going to stay right there in their mission field. And so I help them understand that they're in reality the true missionaries because they're the ones who have been uniquely placed there by God for a purpose, to go into that very same mission field that he has placed them into so that they can go and act out what God has called them to do. And it is usually at the end of my trip that they finally get it. (sighs) In fact, when I went to Cuba, which was my first mission trip, the, the whole purpose of the trip was to teach pastors' kids to be missionaries in Cuba. And so what ended up happening is that after I left Cuba, a couple of weeks after I left Cuba, the big earthquake that hit Guantanamo Bay, that earthquake happened. And who do you think were the first responders? It was those kids. They were the ones who went out to preach the gospel. They were the ones who went out and served the community. They were the ones who went and made disciples. It wasn't me. I didn't go back. It was them. And so just like the people that live in these countries, they are actually the missionaries in their own mission fields Us too, we live in our very own mission field. And we have been called by God to take action in these mission fields. We have our purpose here. And in fact, what I want you to remember from today is that all of us are to be missionaries. Every single one of us are to be missionaries. In fact, I want you to go ahead and say this to yourself. Say, I'm a missionary. Now, come on, like, say it like you mean it. I'm a missionary. There you go. Now, tell the person next to you, you're a missionary. Okay, Now, now that we all get that we're all missionaries... Let's not forget, because if we forget anything from today, I want you to always remember that we're all to be missionaries. You know, Tony read a passage from Matthew 28, and we have been reading this passage for the last few weeks. This is known as the Great Commission. I want to encourage you, if there's a passage in Scripture that you should memorize besides John 3.16, it's obviously Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. You know, Jesus, it says that Jesus came near and said to them, That all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. What's the next word? Go! Therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember that I am with you always to the end of the age. I want you to keep this in mind. Because oftentimes I've heard this passage preached and, man, the pastor just totally takes it from a place where it's not even supposed to be. Look, the emphasis in the Great Commission is to make disciples. That is the whole point of the passage. But if you notice, there's a word right there that's right before, therefore, right? It says what? Go. Right? It says go. And so this phrase, go, In the Greek, when it was originally written, because I don't know if you know, the the New Testament was written in Greek, not in English. That word is actually better translated with the phrase, as you go. In other words, the way that we should be reading this verse should be, therefore, as you go, make disciples. Meaning, as you live life, make disciples. As you're going about your business, make disciples. As you're walking to the groceries, make disciples. As you're going to work, make disciples. As you're going to visit your family, make disciples. As you're going to speak to your suegros, you know, to your in-laws, make disciples. As you're picking up your kids from school, make disciples. Make disciples at all times. What this passage literally means is that making disciples is an everyday action. It's an everyday activity. It's something that we do Every single day. Making disciples is not a once in a lifetime thing. It's not about going on a mission trip once. Maybe if your boss gives you some time off. Maybe if you have enough vacation time. Maybe if you have the money. That's not it. Making disciples is an everyday thing. Because all of us are supposed to be missionaries every single day. In fact, this is what Jesus had in mind when he began looking for his disciples. We read this earlier. Verse 8 from Matthew chapter 4, I'm sorry, verse 18 from Matthew chapter 4 says this. As he was walking along. Now check this out. As he was what? Walking along. As he was going about his way, right? As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them. And I will make you fish for people. Another translation reads, and I will make you fishermen of men. Immediately, 
They left their nets and followed him. See, Jesus' plan from the very beginning was that his disciples would make disciples. That was the plan from the get-go. And I want you to know that the word disciple, by the way, it's a, it's a fancy word for the word follower or for the word learner. That word doesn't mean apostle. I know sometimes we read the word, you know, and we, we, we wonder, is this the 12 disciples only kind of stuff? Is this only for them? No, the word disciple is the word that a person who follows Jesus adopts. That is part of identity. I know that a lot of us usually call ourselves Christians. I mean, I call myself a Christian. But the reality is, is that even the people in the New Testament, they didn't call themselves Christians. They called themselves disciples. In fact, the word Christian is only in the New Testament three times. And two out of those three times, the word Christian is used in a negative connotation. I don't know if you knew that. But the word disciple, on the other hand, is actually being used 261 times. And that is in reference to a couple of things. One, it was their identity, but it was also something that they were doing. And the reason for this is because the word Christian is actually a static word. It's a static word. Meaning, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, we're all Christians. There is no motion. It's just a static word. However, the word disciple is a dynamic word. It's a word that's in motion because I am a disciple, but I'm also discipling. I'm being discipled through this discipleship process. You get it? And so this was all part of Jesus' plan that his disciples would make disciples. It's not just for the pastor. Friends, it's, it's not just for those 12 disciples. Don't make the mistake that a friend of mine made a few years ago when we were talking about making disciples. Uh, this person actually told me, well, listen, stop telling me about this because... Uh, that's actually the pastor's job. I'm just going to do my own thing. I just go to church and I bring my friends and that's it. And Jesus' plan was that all of us would be making disciples. And it's interesting that the words that he used to, as he was going about and walking about the Sea of Galilee, is that he said, I will make you fishermen of men. To me, it's interesting that he used that phraseology, that he used that analogy and not something else, that he would use that kind of language. Obviously, he's talking to fishermen. And so, you know, it would actually speak very close to their hearts that well, as they're fishing, he's like, hold up, I'm going to make you fishermen of men. But it's no accident that he used that phrase. It's no accident that that would be the strategy that he would have for his disciples. In fact, I want you to think about this for a moment. There's this fisherman strategy, right? I want you to think about a fisherman for just one moment. Have you ever gone fishing? Have you ever just gone fishing before? Because I've gone fishing. In fact, seven years ago, I went fishing with my wife for the first time together, and I was actually trying to show off to her how great of a fisherman I was. I wasn't. You know, she, she actually had fished her whole life because she was raised in Cuba, and, like, her dad was a fisherman, and her family's fishermen. And me, I've only gone fishing three times. I'm going over there, and I'm going to impress my wife. And so at the time, she's my girlfriend. I said, like, yeah, you know, I'm going to show you. And so here we are. We're casting rods and stuff, and every time she looked away, and looked back at me like it was just a big nest. Like that fishing line just was a nest. And I was just getting her upset. And I was getting upset because I was telling her, your fishing rods are broken. Like you, you're, you're fishing, they're, they're messed up. Like you don't know what you're doing. And she was like, what are you talking about? They're good. It's you who sucks. Like you are the one who doesn't know. And I was like, oh, okay, I don't know anything. Like I, I'm not even talking about this type of fishing because the fishermen of the day of Jesus, they, they fished with nets just like any professional fisherman out there making a living. They were fishing with nets. But their strategy, have you seen how they go and catch their food? Have you seen how they do it? They go into the water where the fish are. They cast a net. They put the fish in the boat. And then they take them to land. Go home or whatever. Then the next day, they want to catch more fish. They have to go back to where the fish are. Sometimes when they go try to catch fish, there's no fish there, so they have to go to where the fish actually are. And so they go to another place, wherever the fish could be, and they cast their nets, they put them on the boat, and again, and again, and again. See, what I think happens to a lot of us is I think that we're experiencing what most churches in America have experienced, which is that we have grown accustomed to a different strategy that's extremely different from the one that Jesus had in mind for every single one of us. In fact, uh, I think that the strategy for evangelism that we've been using is not at all the fisherman strategy, but instead is the spider web strategy. Not the Spider-Man strategy. That'd be pretty cool, though. Think about it. 
the spider web strategy. And, and what I mean by this is, have you, have you seen how spiders catch their food? Like, even this morning, I had to do this every single day almost. I have to make sure that when I'm walking out of my house or when I'm going into my house, that I avoid certain spider webs because I know exactly where they're going to be. And so I'm always kind of like this because once one gets in your face, you're like, you know, like they're all annoying and uh, they just get in your face. And so have you seen how they do it? Here's how a spider catches their food. You ready? They, they form a web. They sit and wait. They stay still until finally something gets caught. And I think most of us have been encouraged to use this type of strategy. Meaning we, we, we use the spider web strategy when we invite friends to church only and that's it. Like, here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll hope that after months and years of inviting a friend, as our friend is dodging every single invite, kind of like a spider web. It's like, ah, every time we talk about church, it's like, stop talking to me about church. I hate church. Don't bother me with that. It's like a spider web. It gets in my face. They're bothered by that. Because what happens is we use church as a spider web. Where we finally, as after they come, we're hoping that maybe they'll get caught. They'll be intrigued by the message that the pastor preaches. And hopefully, 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 they hear the gospel and they surrender their lives to Jesus. Friends, I'm not saying don't invite your friends to Peter's Road Baptist Church. I'm not saying that. Please, don't, don't, don't do that either. That's not what I'm trying to say. It serves a purpose to invite our friends to church. But what if instead of using Sunday church service as a spider web, what if we would actually go to where our friends are with the mentality of a fisherman, with the strategy of a fisherman, with the tools of a fisherman, with the training of a fisherman, and we will go where the fish are instead of waiting for the fish to come to us. Listen, fishermen and spiders, they catch food very differently. Very differently. One is static. But the other one is always going. It's dynamic. There's motion going. Fishermen go to where the fish are. So I don't know if you've thought about it like that before, but I want to maybe just kind of help you think just a bit further because Jesus, I'm not sure if you know this, Jesus did not die on the cross simply for you and I to sit in our home or in our church pews so that we can listen to the pastor preach. That's not the point. If you think that's the point, man, you've missed out entirely. See, he represented us on the cross. That's what this whole series has been about. Represent at. He represented each and every single one of us on the cross. So now we go and represent him everywhere we go. We're literally carrying our suitcase, and we're always ready to share with someone what Christ has done. We're fishing Hey, guys, we are fishing. We're not sitting. We're not waiting. We're going. All of us are missionaries. In fact, there's this passage which will help me take this a bit further. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's a passage that I know that a lot of us are familiar with, but maybe you haven't thought about it before in this way. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. See, what happens a lot of times when we read this passage is we kind of just stop here and we really only truly focus on the reality that we are a new creation because we're now in Christ. Oh, I love that I'm a new creation. Oh, I love that God has made me new, that I'm no longer my old self. Oh, I love how God has done all these wonderful things for me. I love that. I love that. I love Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. You're amazing. But friends, that's not where the passage stops. In fact, it keeps going. It says, therefore, given the fact that you're a new creation, that God has reconciled us to himself, that he has casted his net and he has brought, it upon his, he has brought us upon his boat, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, he represented us so that we would now represent him everywhere we go. And I want you to think about an ambassador for a moment because an ambassador is 
Not a person that I know that most of us usually deal with on a regular basis, but I think that all of us have a pretty good idea of what an ambassador is supposed to do, right? Ambassadors, what do they do? What are they known for? Like, they literally represent the leader and the nation of the country that they come from in foreign land. Now, when you're reading this in the New Testament time, an ambassador is not just anyone. Just like right now, an ambassador is not just anyone. See, a person who experienced an ambassador in these times was the equivalent of experiencing the king of a nation. If you were in the presence of an ambassador, you were in the presence of a king. If you wanted to know what the king thought, you would speak to the ambassador in a foreign land. That's what would happen. And so in the same way, anyone that does not know Jesus gets a chance to meet him when they meet us. Have you thought about that before? Anyone who does not know Jesus gets a chance to meet him when they meet us. And so I guess the, the question here is, okay, well, Pastor Mike, how, how do we do this? How, how do we go about it? What, where do we start? How do we do this? Well, you know, Jesus actually gave us a plan. Uh, and uh, actually, Luke, he, he wrote a similar account of the Great Commission just before Jesus ascended into heaven. And it's found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And it says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my what? My witnesses. That means you will go and you will represent me. You will speak on my behalf. In where? In Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I know that when we read this, we often think, okay, this is a geographical plan that Jesus gave for his disciples. I mean, obviously... This is not for me. This is for them because they are in Jerusalem. And so now they got to figure out all these other stuff. But if that's all we do, then we've missed it. Because this is not only a geographical plan. This is also a, a social plan. Think about it from this perspective. See, Jerusalem was their home base. It, these are concentric circles, by the way. Jerusalem was their home base. It, it was their home. Then you have Judea. Judea was their neighboring friends. Then you have Samaria, which were their acquaintances. These were people that they dealt with on a regular basis, but they didn't quite have a relationship with them. And then the ends of the earth. That's all the strangers that a person could possibly encounter. And so what does that look like for us? Well, if, if that's the case for the 12 disciples and for the 120 disciples that were there, well, for us, Jerusalem is our family. We, we start home. We start with our family. Who are the members in our family that have not yet experienced Jesus, that still don't know him? Are you fishing at home? Or are you setting spider webs? You know, being a missionary starts in the home. It starts with your family. Then, if you're following me, then you know that the next group of people that we have to be missionaries to is our friends. These are people that we talk to on a regular basis. These are people that are on our favorites on our phone. These are people that we often comment on their social media statuses or whatnot. Like, these are our friends. We're supposed to be missionaries to them. And then we have our acquaintances. Now, these are your Facebook friends that you have that you have collected over the years that you have no idea where you met or who, how you know them. These are the people that you deal with, but you don't quite necessarily know personally. You're just kind of like, yeah, like I know him. It's probably like your neighbor from like three or four down, three doors down from you that you just, you know, hey, neighbor, but that's as far as you get. Like you don't even know each other's names. Those are the acquaintances. And the ears of the earth is obviously, it's all the strangers that we could possibly ever meet. Now, see, what happens is a lot of times we'll learn how to evangelize. We'll learn how to share the gospel with people. And we'll actually only do this with strangers. But that's not the plan that Jesus had. He said, start from home. Start with your own people. Start there. And so if you're listening to all of this, and I guess you're probably having the same questions that most people are having, which is, okay, Pastor Mike, I agree with you. I finally see that I'm supposed to be a missionary, that I'm supposed to go and take my suitcase and be where the people are and go where the people are and represent Jesus wherever I go. I get it. Pastor Mike, you were talking about how you were a fisherman and you were terrible at fishing. I, I feel like I'm the same way. Like, I don't know how to fish for people. I don't know how to do that. 
I'm lost. Every time I speak, I get lost. I get like nervous. Like I shivers and stuff. I'm like, you know, like it's just not my thing. I, that's why I always invite my friends to church because Pastor Mike, let's just face it, Dr. Lema, he's an amazing preacher. And like you, like you're okay too every now and then, right? Like, listen, we, we just want to do our part. And it's like, friend, if you want to be a missionary, you're going to need some training. And so what I want to invite you to is that you would actually go through this 10-minute training that we uploaded onto our website. And this is the website that you get to go to, petersville.org slash gospel. If you do this 10-minute training and you practice it for a few times, you will get to do what my wife and I have done, which is we have gone in our neighborhood and we have knocked on people's doors and we have preached the gospel using this strategy that is shown in our website. We've used this strategy, and friends, it works. And let me, let me just go ahead and just put it right off there, right off the bat. Whenever you go preach the gospel, I get it. Sometimes people will not listen. Sometimes people will just not want to hear. You're not going out there selling cell phones. You're going out there preaching the gospel. You're bringing the good news to them. You're bringing them life. You're bringing them hope. So if when you're having a conversation with them and they turn it down, it's not, they're not turning you down. They're turning God down, but... No, nothing is going in void. You're going in there and you're doing your thing. Hey, when fishermen go out to fish, uh, sometimes they don't catch any fish. But that doesn't mean they stop going. So we cannot stop going if a person does not come to know Christ. We do our part, God does his part. We do our portion of it, God takes care of the other portion of it. But we are his missionaries. We are the ones that have to make an appeal on behalf of God to the people to be reconciled back with him and so go to this website go to this site and take those 10 minutes rehearse this with your family but before before i close out i think i think it's important to note that before anyone can become a missionary we have to be made new by christ as the passage we just read says that christ has made us into a new creation and so I, I want to take just this one moment. Maybe you're hearing all of this and you're saying, okay, what is this whole deal? What are the good news? What's everything? Let me just go ahead and help you see this, friend. See, the reality of our lives right now is that there's a virus going on in this pandemic. But the biggest, biggest danger in our lives is not whether or not we catch the COVID-19. The biggest virus in our lives is called the sin virus. Because all of us have sinned. The Word of God says that all of us have sinned. And we have fallen short of the glory of God. What this means is that because God is perfect, because God is holy, and because we are not, we cannot even be in the same place. We have fallen short of His glory. We, cannot even, we can't share anything in common. We cannot be family. We cannot be in the same room. Nothing. We can't even experience him in heaven because we have fallen short of his glory. But the worst part of it all is that it doesn't only end there. The word of God also says in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. Meaning that because you and I have lied, because you and I have done dumb things, because we have chosen to go on the wrong path, for whatever reason it may be, whether it's a light thing or a big thing, it doesn't matter. Just the wage of that sin, the payment that you and I have to make for that sin is death. It's a pretty steep price. But what I love about that passage is that it doesn't stop there. It actually says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Friend, God is basically giving you the option to pay for your own sins if you want or to let him pay for your sins. This is a free gift to us. It wasn't free to him. It cost him everything. He was on the cross. We needed to be on that cross, but he was on that cross. This is how we know that we love God. This word says that while we were still sinners, God sent his son to pay for our sins on the cross. While we were still sinners. And so what you and I need to do is... As God's word talks about how we need to repent from our ways, meaning we need to turn back to God. We need to change our mind and realize that our way is not the right way, that it's his way. 
And if you want this, his word also says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Friend, today there's a net going in your direction. You can either swim towards it, or you can run away from it. But God is telling you right now, I died for you, I paid for you, come with me. If you want to be a part of God's family, if you want this, if you want to begin to follow him today, then I want to invite you to pray this with me. Pray this with me. And by the way, the words that I'm about to say are not magical words. It's whether or not you mean this in your heart. Pray this with me. Just repeat after me. God, today I come to you asking you for forgiveness because I have sinned against you because I have gone my own way. Father, I want to turn to you today. I want to surrender my life to you. And I accept you as my king, as my Lord, as my Savior. I want to ask you that today you make me new. I want to follow you for the rest of my days. And you know my prayer. Amen. Amen. Now listen, if you prayed this prayer with me for the first time, welcome. Welcome. And would you let us know by going to petersroad.org slash connect. Because being a disciple, being a follower of Christ is not a static thing. It's not for you to stay at home and do nothing. In fact, we would love to help you understand what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. We would love to share what's in this suitcase. We would love to share that with you. So let us know on our website. Just click the thing that says, I accepted Christ or I made a decision to follow Jesus today. And we will follow up with you. We will pray with you. We want to provide you with resources. And for all of us here in the church, I want to just close this out in prayer. Father, I ask you that as we are going about our day, that whether or not we're stuck at home or we're going into the groceries, Father, that we carry our suitcase, that we be seen as the people that are always moving, that we're going to make disciples, that we don't stop. We're not spiders. We're fishermen, Father. And I ask you that we adopt your mentality of fishermen going out into the field fishing for men. I ask you these things in your name. And if you believe that prayer, would you say amen with me? Amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and go in peace for this week. Make sure you tune in this Wednesday for our Bible study at 7 p.m. And don't forget, at 2 p.m., Kids Corner, Kids Corner has an activity. So go on our website to find out about how you can get your kids signed up to that. God bless.